If you're enjoying Always Take Notes, please consider supporting us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you sign up on Patreon, you get a great selection of rewards, uh, including sheaves of successful magazine pitches from myself, Rachel, and um, previous co-hosts of the show. Uh, And you also get to really help us keep this thing going, paying our producers properly, that sort of thing. We'd like to give a particular shout out this week to uh, another of our Patreons, who is Josh Scott. I hope we're pronouncing your name correctly, who signed up uh, last month. Many thanks indeed, Josh. Hello, and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, we spoke to Matthew Saeed. We talked to Matthew about the challenges of combining table tennis and starting a career in journalism, his hugely successful popular science books, and the challenges of writing a column. It's a great episode. We hope you enjoy it. So, Matthew, great to have you on uh, Always Take Notes. This is another episode that we're recording during the lockdown, but hopefully the audio uh, this time will be uh, a little bit smoother. We wanted to start off by asking about your, your kind of early life and how did your developing passion for table tennis and your entry into journalism go hand in hand? Or, or how did those things, those things kind of run in parallel? Well, thank you for having me on. Great, great to be here despite the lockdown. Uh, well, you're, you're right. Table tennis is definitely a big part of my life. Um, don't call it ping pong. Uh, I uh, started at school, primary school, and became obsessed with, with this wonderfully intricate, complex, uh, highly strategic game and took over my life, really. I left school early, 16, um, do, during the first year of A-levels to play full time. Um, as I was getting to the end of the table tennis career, my father, who had always been against me leaving school, um, he's from a Pakistani background, very educationally focused. Um, he had pointed out that what would I do when table tennis ended? And that did become quite a live concern in my late 20s. Um, and I phoned director inquiries uh, to get the telephone number of the Times newspaper. Actually, I did. I tried The Guardian first, uh, but I didn't get a call back. Then I dialed 192. Older listeners will remember that's how you used to get telephone numbers back then and got the number of the times, got through. And uh, they offered, uh, well, they said, if you can fax it, this will show you how long ago this was. They said, fax in some ideas and we might be able to take some articles from you on sport. And, and, and that was how I transitioned into, into journalism. Um, so they were all sport from the beginning. It was um, That was your kind of journalistic focus. It wasn't really a focus. It was the only option. I, I mean, it was very rare that I got in. I, I think the first time I got into the play, I did write a couple, didn't make the cut. Um, and then on May, sort of spring 1999, I got a piece into the Times that was actually published on long pimples, which is a type of table tennis rubber. Uh, slightly uh, obtuse topic, admittedly. Um, but from then, for, for, for a number of years, really, I got in very sporadically, quickly, um, or, yeah, always on sport, but, but I felt very lucky to get anything in at all, frankly. Um, but yes, that's how it was for, for much of my early, well, I don't think I'd call it a journalistic career. I was on like £100 an article. Um, that, <laughs> that's how it worked for quite a long time but, but you had had you had also gone to university and things like that in parallel to playing table tennis right or was I that's yeah. right so uh six years so I left school and then I taught myself my a levels after a couple of years of playing table tennis alone uh, sorry table tennis on its own um I actually felt that I needed something more in my life. So I did buy textbooks and started reading them. And because I was reading them because I wanted to read them rather than a teacher telling me to do so, my motivation really completely changed. And yes, I was very lucky to get into Oxford. I was, my dad filled out the application for the UCA form, it was called back then. I was playing table tennis in Sweden at the time. He forged my signature which I hope doesn't invalidate the degree. Um, but uh, he said, you have an interview at an Oxford college, even though my O-level results were not very good and I didn't have any A-levels, but they did um, give me a, what was called a conditional offer. And then I ran the table tennis career. I mean, it was very difficult to go to Oxford and play international table tennis at the same time. I was away from Oxford, I'd say four days a week minimum. 
um, even in term time. So I wasn't there very much, but I did a PPE degree, so you didn't really need to be, there weren't many lectures, it was the tutorials, and I, I went back to Oxford for those. Um, what was it about The Guardian and the Times that appealed to you? Well, we, my family read The Guardian, um, and so I tried them first, and then The Times... I don't know, maybe my memory's playing tricks, but I think they had a little period where they sold the Times on Mondays for 10p, and I read it for a bit. Lucky, really. The, the sport, I got, you know, with The Guardian, I got through to the secretary of the sports department um, and left a message and never got a call back. I tried a few times. With The Times, I got straight through to the sports editor who had actually heard of me. He had once written an article when I was at Oxford um, on this table tennis playing intellectual. Um, and he had heard my name, so he said, yeah, he, he was quite uh, up for me sending ideas. And could you give us a bit of an explanation, maybe for people who aren't as familiar with the sport, what, you know, what your kind of routine in your life as an international table tennis player was like? Like, how, how did it compare, you know, how, was it all playing games or were there elements of gym work and, and things like that? Ooh, how, how, does it com- how does it compare to, to being a, a professional sportsman in other disciplines? Oh, very interesting. Yes, yeah, so um, very professional. Uh, I mean, actually, the money was good. I, t- I mean, I took a very big pay cut when I left. Uh, I mean, it's because China, Everton was very big in China, which was commercializing in the 80s. So the money was pretty good. But we'd wait, you know, wake up, train, get on the table, well, obviously a warm-up, and then get on the table 9.30, train 45 minutes, 10-minute break, then another 45 minutes flat out, um, stretching, lunch, sleep in the after, uh, early afternoon, train again uh, on the table. And then after the second training, you would do sprints, weights, or cardiovascular work of one kind or another. And this was interspersed with um, club matches in France, international circuit around Europe and the rest of the world, and then the very big set piece events like the Olympics. And did you, um, forgive me if you've already kind of mentioned this, but did the kind of table tennis ever coincide with the journalism? Were there times where you were kind of finishing training and going and writing an article or juggling the two? Yes, so so 1999, about a year out from the Olympics is when I pitched. And because I was in the Olympics, actually I was a bit naughty. I hadn't been selected for the Olympics, kind of, implied that I had been. Um, And I I sort of pitched it as a diary column. Um, so it was they they overlapped for for a couple of years, and and then after the Olympics in two thousand, not long about two seasons after that, I retired, um, and then there was no table tennis. But uh, I mean, journalism wasn't paying very much, so I had other. I always had other sort of careers, other things that I was doing at the same time. That remains the case now, um, but journalism writing took up a sort of an increasing share of my time. And could you tell us about how your career at the Times developed before, up, up to the point when the book started? So how did you go from, from pitching ideas by, by fax to, to kind of getting an inroad at the newspaper there? Well, actually, it's funny you say that, pitching ideas by fax. The first articles I wrote, I didn't have a laptop. Did I have a laptop? No, I didn't have a laptop. So I would um, write them longhand okay. and then dictate them to my mum, who I was living in South West London. She lived in, <laughs> she lived in Reading. She would and type them into her computer. She would then go and um, fax them for me. But my fax machine, they came out on this very flimsy, I don't know if you remember, the very sort of flimsy, plasticky kind of paper. Yeah. I'd then take it to the dry cleaners that had a printer at the top of the road. They would, <laughs> and, then, and then print it on proper paper and then refax it to the Times. Funnily enough, the, the telephone number for the Times, the fax number, is still the same as it is today, which is which is quite nice. But um, uh, and then uh, did that for a few years. I suppose a big turning point was a biggish turning point was getting a weekly column in the sports pages, um, rather than having to hope that I might get in from week to week. Once you have a column, you can establish a voice. And I suppose I started to think of my, myself as a, as a yeah, I suppose, as a writer at about that point. So that was about 2008. So um, it took a good nine years to get to that point. How easy is it to find subjects for your columns? Um, is it something that's got easier over time or is it still kind of waiting for inspiration to strike every week? <laughs> Well, frankly, if I'm being completely honest, I moved to a two-column-a-week um, 
uh, routine. I did a I did, I did the back page of our football supplement on Mondays called the game, and a, my sports column has always been on Wednesday. I have to be honest. I'd say about a year ago, I started to feel a bit jaded. I, I, I felt that I wasn't really coming up with original ideas, particularly in the football column. Um, it was still very well received, to be honest. Readers extremely um, uh, nice about it. But I, I did say to the Times about three months ago, uh, maybe four months ago, something like that, maybe a bit longer, that I wanted to drop the football column. And I think that was a that was definitely the right move. And could you tell us then about how the, the move to writing books took place? Was that something that you had, had preconceived and were wanting to do for a while or were you offered? How, how, again, we always try on the podcast to really get into the mechanics of how these, you know, these publishing deals come, come, come to pass. So, yeah, how, how, what was the origin of, of moving to, to books? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, ah, so, so I, through table tennis, I knew a guy called Howard Jacobson. Does that, does that yeah, he's a, he's a novelist, right? He's a novelist yeah. and a very good table tennis player. Hmm. He said, uh, he had followed some of my journalism and said, why don't you write a book? He introduced me to an agent who I went to meet, a guy called Johnny, um, Johnny Geller. Uh, and he said, uh, Freakonomics had just come out. And he said, why don't you write a Freakonomics of sport, which is, in other words, you know, use sport as a way of looking at the wider world. Um, and I think two days after that first meeting, uh, he introduced me to the person who had edited Freakonomics, who was in London for a book fair. And we got on very well and they commissioned a book there and then. Um, so I had a year to get my skates on and put something together. And I enjoyed it a lot. So Bounce came out. That was my first book. It's called Bounce in 2010. But it was all about quite a bit more than sport and it did quite well. Um, and then I wrote Black Box Thinking, took five years actually after the publication of Bounce. And then I, I wrote a children's book. Um, and then my most recent book, Rebel Ideas. You had won um, Sports Feature Writer of the Year in 2008 and Sports Journalist of the Year in 2009. Do you think that gave you a stronger hand going into writing a book in terms of sales and profile and also being able to command a higher advance? Uh, oh, possibly. Um, yeah, yeah, probably did help a bit. It's difficult to tell, isn't it, whether these things help that much. But yes, I think it probably did help a bit. Um, although I'm not sure. I'm, I, yeah, I, I, I would the. I mean, it's actually the person who edited Free Economics is American, so I doubt they would have been aware of any of this. I, I suspect what happened is she and I got on very well. Had a, had a good chat. Um, she probably fancied taking a punt on me and um, uh, perhaps it might, might, might have made a difference on the margins. Obviously, the books have done very well uh, since, since the first one came out. And we again ask with people who've experienced big success with their titles, was there like a particular moment when you realised that, that this was breaking through or it was reaching a wider audience? And do you have a sense of what the factors that went into that were? Um, I, that's an interesting question. I, I feel that, the, I mean, the books that I've written have definitely had a good audience in the UK. Uh, I mean, the thing, I, I suppose every writer will say, the thing that really brings it home is, is the letters and the emails that you get from people who have read and have responded to the book. I mean, mine are non-fiction books, often about self-improvement, um, about psychology, about the sort of nature of science and understanding. Um, and when you get nice feedback from, from readers, letters, that's, I think, when you really realise that you've made a difference. And often they will refer to particular stories or passages, and that feels good because often, you know, that, that particular passage may have taken a bit of research or it might have taken a while to find an academic paper that substantiates a particular claim, um, but I think that was that was the the really strong um, feedback that that I enjoyed. You mentioned having to get your skates on a bit um, to produce Bounce. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the research process? Um, you also mentioned uh, academic papers. Did you have any kind of research assistants helping you with that, or was it stuff that you'd already come across that you were able to reshape into a book? Yeah, so that again is, wow, this is really interesting because I did advertise for a research system for Bounce um, and did interview quite a few people. But 
no one really felt quite the right fit. For Black Box Thinking, I did have a part-time research assistant paid. Um, and although they were wonderful people, a wonderful person, brilliant Joe, um, that didn't work either. Um, the, the, uh, oddly enough, the one person who has made quite a big difference in terms of finding things of great use for the books is my mum, who with bounce found the key paper that really drove the first part of that book and, uh, and just seemed to have the eye for the kind of material that could bolster an argument. And the same with black box thinking and with rebel ideas. My mum, and she would do it, you know, not in a formal way. She would just say, you know, we'd chat when I'd go down for, for a roast on Sunday or some other time of the week and I'll tell her what I was writing about. And she has a great facility for really grasping what one needs. Um, so she was going to tremendous help. You mentioned Freakonomics as a, a kind of touchstone when this the, the first book was being commissioned. I'm, with this integration of, of pop science and looking for a broader audience, I don't know if it's the right terminology, but was Malcolm Gladwell another touchstone you were conscious of? Gladwell is a fantastic... I mean, I think um, Outliers and uh, Blink uh, are both marvellous, uh, brilliant books. Um, Outliers, I feel very equivocal about. I think that's his best book came out a few months before Bounce was published. And Bounce covered some of the same terrain. And I remember reading it with a combination of admiration and deep anxiety because I thought, gosh, you know, he is, I mean, he quoted the Ericsson paper that my mum had found. Um, he used a couple of examples that were in my book. It, it felt that I had to reference him because it was such a big book out loud at the time. But I'm just very glad that there were other things in Bounce, and I think I approached it in a slightly different way. But yes, a huge influence, uh, Bradwell, and um, a fine, fine non-fiction writer. And just following up on that, I mean, Gladwell faces some criticism from the scientific establishment for his for his approach and, you know, for ha perhaps sort of cherry-picking things and things like that. What, what do you think of, of that kind of the, the critique that would say that you know, these ideas are complicated and that by, by drawing kind of big conclusions out of them, we can risk simplifying. Or, or you know, the, the, broad, the broader kind of critique of this kind of very ideas-led nonfiction. What would be your thought? I think, I think some of it's quite fair, the criticism, but, but some of it's a little unfair as well. So one of the themes in Bounce, I mean, I've, um, it, it's a very interesting phenomenon. When Bounce started off, it was you know, almost universal acclaim. When it became very successful... I did get some uh, heat from scientists for oversimplifying the academic literature, uh, but it was very interesting. I mean, Gladwell experienced the same thing um, with Outliers, but he was very careful in the early um, part of that book to explain. So, so the argument for what it's worth is the relative importance of talent on the one hand or genetic variation and cultural factors on the other hand in the explanation of success in different contexts. And Gladwell, and obviously it's a combination of both, Gladwell's point was that we tended to focus on talent too much. That's an empirical claim about how society thinks about success. But he made it extremely clear early on that he wasn't ruling out talent as a very important factor. But he said what we need to do is look also not just at the quality of the seed, but also you know, where the plant is growing within the forest, is it overshadowed by other trees and all of these other things. And what's interesting about this, for me, very, very interesting, is that almost all of the research that has come out over the last five years has, in very interesting new ways, shown how this argument about the importance of culture to success, to intelligence, to IQ, uh, to scientific advance and innovation, it's 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 moving more and more in that direction. Um, so science does move for sure, um, and I think that while some of the critiques of Malcolm Gladwell, um, David and Goliath, I personally critiqued. I reviewed it for the Times, and I thought it was 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 a lot weaker than his previous books. So I think some of it's fair, some of it's very unfair. In other words, they build a straw man version of Gladwell to criticise. Um, well, I think you have to take the arguments in their totality. Um, 
to understand its value. And I think Outliers was a genuinely very good book. And could we talk about black box thinking in 2015? What made you want to write a book about the different ways to can think about failure and learn from failure? So I, I'm very interested at university in scientific method. I mean, it goes back to the previous question in some ways. And one of the hallmarks of science is the willingness to come up with testable hypotheses that can be falsified. You, you come up with an idea, and if somebody performs an experiment that shows that the idea doesn't work, then that idea is overturned, and that provides the foundations for a new idea. In other words, science is very willing to take failure seriously. And I think that's the hallmark of its greatness as a human institution. And that, of course, was an argument made by Karl Popper, a philosopher, great philosopher, 20th century philosopher. And it seemed to me that you look across the world and those systems that are capable of failing well, of learning from mistakes, perform much better through time. And those that try and deny or um, elude their failures tend to stagnate and go backwards. And that was really the basis for black box thinking. And the title black box is the black box in an aircraft that can be used to figure out what went wrong so that reforms can be put in place. And this is why, in my view, aviation has a very good track record of safety. It's constantly learning from mistakes. I was really interested to, to look at your work on the, particularly on this growth mindset idea, because I, I came across that a number of years ago, I think actually before your book came out, because I was writing a magazine piece about uh, GCSEs and looking at people who'd done very well in their GCSEs and then seeing what it had meant to them later on. And I, I remember talking to a psychologist, I think at Stanford, who yeah, said that you either, if you did very well in your sort of first exposure to, to public exams, you either became obsessed with curating your record, as she put it, so mm -hmm. with not like not putting a foot wrong, but to do that, you would actively avoid opportunity and risk or you would have actually actually used the same phrase a growth mindset that achievement would be important to you but it would not be the most important thing do you think that you know that has an that would you think that's a fair reading of our educational system with regard to how these things work yeah i think that is a very very i mean if you think of science i mean science had a fixed mindset for almost two thousand years in other words uh, they uh, what was the phrase you used? You cur they curated their hypothesis. They you know the world is six thousand years old. It's the centre of the solar system, and that was it. They didn't want to challenge those preconceptions. It was only the scientific revolution when the scientific community, simplifying a little bit, moved to a growth mindset. In other words, we have some good ideas, but there's more to discover. In other words, we want to test those ideas. We want to reach out to diverse voices to see how we might improve our understanding of natural phenomena. That was a psychological revolution of the kind that Dweck argues we need a bit more of in our educational systems. And I think she's, if Dweck is, I think, the psychologist you might be yeah, referring to. Yeah, it is. That, that, I've, I've forgotten her name, but yeah, it was her. I interviewed her. Yeah, she was really good. She's great. And she and I have become very, very good friends. And that's a very big part of... Um, uh, the way I think about the world. I mean, it's this interaction between psychology systems um, that really drives progress. Um, I was interested to, see, interested to see some reporting that when he was health secretary, Jeremy Hunt was uh, inspired by your work um, as the intellectual basis for kind of reform of the NHS. What does that look like in healthcare? What does a growth mindset and black box thinking mean in that, in that field? So, so one of the early parts of black box thinking is contrasting healthcare with aviation. Aviation analyzes its near misses and its accidents very systematically and very honestly to reform its procedures and its ergonomic design and all the other performance critical aspects of what it does. In healthcare, I'm sorry to say, that is a big weakness. Uh, for two reasons. One, there's a blame culture, which means that when frontline professionals are open about their mistakes, instead of seeing this as a learning opportunity, they're often penalized or sanctioned or struck off or put on trial for culpable homicide. The other problem, it's also a significant problem, is the ego of senior doctors who don't like to admit that they're fallible. Um, going back to the fixed mindset that, that we were talking about earlier, 
and that obfuscates institutional learning too. So Jeremy Hunt uh, read the book, he got in touch, and I spent uh, many hours in his office with healthcare leaders talking through how uh, British healthcare could be reformed to make it a more, uh, to make it a learning organisation. And one of the reforms, one of many, was the introduction of something called a healthcare safety investigation branch modelled on the aviation accident branch, which had a legal mandate to learn from mistakes and issue reports to drive improvements to, to British healthcare. So some nice things came along uh, off the back of that. It's interesting, just in the in the run-up to this interview, while I was researching it, um, I was, was looking at that aviation medicine argument you were making. And I'm in parallel at the moment, I'm doing a big magazine piece about the corona responders. So I'm, I'm interviewing twice a week a range of doctors uh, and nurses and so forth. And I, was, I raised this with a, an ITU doctor who I was speaking to last week uh, about this aviation comparison. And he pushed back on it saying that he felt that they, you, you can't compare across the two and that a better comparison for healthcare was construction because you know, as in, you know, that was the argument that, that he made. He felt there were more analogies from how building sites had been made safe than from how uh, you know, medical work had. What are your thoughts on, on that? Well, construction is a very good example of an industry that has a poor track record of learning from different... I mean, remember, there's lots of different types in the States, but he, may, the, the, he or she, the... Uh, doctor you referred to may have been talking about safety incidents in construction. Um, but it's a very similar approach. The very good uh, construction, they need to have open reporting of mistakes and analysis to see if there's a pattern in the safety incidents, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, are these safety incidents happening for similar reasons? And then this is sometimes called root cause analysis and then changes to the system to bear down upon those mistakes. So I, I suppose some doctors don't like the analogy with aviation because they think healthcare is more complex than um, flying a plane. And that's true. But the complexity makes the learning even more important. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, most of the doctors who, I mean, I think when people, I mean, for my feedback so far is that most of the doctors who have actually read the book have, have, have felt that the analogy works, but uh, that you're right, there is a bit of pushback uh, from some. We do a lot, I mean, I have a business, we do a lot of work with some of the biggest construction companies in the world to improve incident reporting. Um, and I mean, a couple of the construct, they now have black box rooms where they analyze safety incidents. Um, they make sure that these learnings are then metabolized by all of their different sites and it's having really, really strong impact on the number of avoidable um, incidents, the amount of avoidable harm to frontline professionals. You mentioned uh, your your other businesses and other um, forms of income. It's a rule of the podcast uh, that we ask about money and how it intersects with a, a writing life. Could you spell out in terms as you know as clear or as or as not as you as you like? But the division of your income between your column, your podcasts, and public speaking and books and and anything else you might be doing um oh i don't think i've ever been asked that question before uh, except my accountant um so i earn uh, money from journalism writing books i have a business uh which is a consultancy business uh which helps organizations with culture mindset and with um creating learning system innovation um what were the other ones you mentioned uh public speaking yes i do public speaking um a bit of broadcasting not very much broadcasting but a bit of broadcasting um it's a very eclectic set of things really uh books did i mention the books yeah so so i'd say maybe four or five different things that i do i, I don't think i'm missing anything out but i'm i'm thinking if you think of anything that I've missed out, I'll, I'll jump in. And w what is the ratio between those in terms of, uh, you know, where is, where is the majority of your income coming from? I would say um, it's quite a difficult one to answer. It depends how fast one writes a book, if you see what I mean. If, if, if I do one quite quickly, then I can move on to the next one. If it takes a few years, then the 
advance is sort of diluted. I, I suppose if your listeners are a lot of book writers, I'll know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but I would say the journalism and books uh, would be sort of quite significantly under 50% of, of overall earnings. And your business, has that, you've been running that since before the books came out? Could you tell us a bit about, you know, what you do? And you, you mentioned going consulting with construction firms, but has that really expanded on the back of your your book writing? Yeah, so the business, we I got a lot of people wondering how to take some of the arguments in the books and how to actually apply them in practice. And it's a really unusual life because it means I'm having interactions with senior executives, sometimes the chief executives at some of the biggest companies in the world who are teasing through what it means to live in a rapidly changing world, how their business model might be superseded by a competitor in a few years' time. Um, obviously, this particular epidemic has obviously had massive implications for business. And so um, it, I, instead of just doing this in a ad hoc way, I thought it would be a good idea to start a business. And I, it's been a really enjoyable thing. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a different kind of a challenge to a creative challenge, uh, bringing people in. We have a very good managing director. Obviously, we've been hit very hard by the uh, coronavirus epidemic, like a lot of other businesses. Um, but that has been a you know a really interesting challenge. And I think it gives you, for what it's worth, you know, a range of other skills about decision making and working with others in a in a team and and other things of that kind. What was it like um, writing for a different audience? You mentioned your book for for children. Um, you are awesome in two thousand and eighteen. How easy is it to tailor your subject for a younger audience? That's that's really so. So um, uh, you are awesome was really a collation of bounce and black box thinking for kids. And again, that was very much based on feedback from adult readers who said, "Yes, our kids need to know that." You know, resilience is important, that they occasionally make mistakes. That's okay. That's how you grow. We're worried that they're trying to look perfect and they're not taking any risks and they're desperately worried about making mistakes. So trying to convert that into a kid's format was very, very um, daunting, if I'm honest. Um, it was a wonderful thing to do because it, it's uh, it's had a marvellous uh, feedback from young readers uh, but I'm working, have been working on a new one called Dare to Be You. Just finished that. Comes out in September. So it's just, you know, it takes a bit of time to try and put yourself in the mind of a young reader and think what sort of examples would they respond to. And um, but I'm glad I did it. Could we talk about uh, Team Sky now? So you, you know, you talked about their their practices and and use of marginal gains and so forth before the the criticism came out. Um, and I saw that you, you wrote a piece uh, kind of saying, pointing to the, the increases in, in cycling that, that has been pushed by that and so forth. Do you think looking back on that, do you have any regrets on, on the relationship that you had with them? Do you think you could have got too close? Or what, what is your thoughts now that a bit of time has passed on that, on that whole episode? Yes, yeah, so um, Team Sky, oh, they've actually now been superseded by a new team called Team Ineos. Uh, but British Cycling has done very well at the Olympic Games, won lots of gold medals, and Team Sky was kind of an outshoot of that for road cycling. I wasn't much of an expert in cycling, slightly sceptical myself when it happened, um, but having watched them and got to know them a bit, very impressed with their methods, with their uh, attention to detail, um subsequently so i in uh, black box thinking i have a chapter on marginal gains i think marginal gains are very important i mean it's basically scientific method really that you um try and isolate particular things that can help you to improve um so that i, I mean, so so and if you can find lots of small improvements with high attention to detail, they can accumulate and you can have a big... So this is very important in developmental economics, for example. Esther Dufflow, who recently won the Nobel Prize, instead of having big grand plans for the developing world, doing small things that you can test very rigorously, make sure that they work before scaling them up. So I think it's a, it's a very, very important um, 
a very important method. Uh, but uh, you mentioned Team Sky. I think Team Sky is an organisation that uses marginal gains, but there is a suspicion that they may have used some marginal gains that were not part of the rules, uh, which would be obviously very disappointing if they if they did that. Do you think that you know you? Do you think? I mean, how do you how do you walk that line with, particularly if you're doing kind of consultancy work with some of these organisations and things, in terms of maintaining you know, not just with them but with with these various institutions you're interacting with? How do you how do you police those boundaries, as it were? Well, with with Team Sky, I don't really have a relationship with Team Sky, so I write I occasionally have written about them for the Times. Um, and obviously mention them in in black box thinking. I mentioned Mercedes as well, and and other organisations. I'd only mention them if I thought they were you know good organisations. Um, and if it turns out they've done anything wrong, obviously I'll be the first to to criticise them. Um, but uh, at the time I wrote it, none of these suspicions were really out there. They came out a bit later, when there was a hack by trying to piece together the timing but I think some there was Russians, a hack at, some Russian fancy yeah, bear. yeah yeah fancy fa- that's right fancy bear so Bradley Wiggins who's a brilliant cyclist um uh he was I think he basically there's a slight tension between what it well perhaps more than a slight tension between what he was saying in his in his book and what was actually going on in his uh medical treatment and I think a lot of people felt very let down by that um you mentioned that you know there's not been a firm conclusion on the Team Sky um, allegations, but some journalists looking back at the uh, reports and you know journalistic exposés and stuff have said that Sky was enabled by a pliant media by an uns- unskeptical public because their rise was almost too good a story. Do you think that's fair? Um, y- yes, possibly it is fair. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult one. Remember, t- British cycling. People like Laura Trott and Jason Kenny um, and others, uh, Victoria Pendleton. I, I, so there's a very large group of people who were winning gold medals for Great Britain. Um, some of them went into Team Sky and then performed extremely well for Team Sky. So if I think it's worth saying that if there has been systematic cheating, which is the explanation for all of these different athletes doing extremely well across a reasonably long period of time. It, it, I mean, it's it, that would be both, I think, very sad in some ways that they're prepared to cheat on that scale. But it's also, I think, not inconceivable that not all of them were cheating or that quite a few of them did it clean. Um, and it may well be that there were one or two who were cheating. So it's very difficult to say. Remember, no, it's, I think it's probably too early to say, but there are a lot of discrepancies, a lot of things that don't quite add up. Um, and I've I said many times in my column, I mean, actually, as soon as the Fancy Bears leak came out, I've always said in my column, it would be wonderful if they could explain these discrepancies. And moreover, if there is a whistleblower who's prepared to explain exactly what's been going on, I would happily publish it in the Times. I would love to know it. Uh, but I think maybe it is fair to say that the British media are a little bit too believing um, before that leak. Could we just, kind of moving on from that, talk about um, like process a little bit? You talked a bit about earlier in the interview about when you had research assistants, when you didn't. Like how, when you're pulling together a book like this, what does it start with? Do you have a kind of skeleton of what the argument is and then sense of who you need to go to for reporting? And how much of the work is, is reading academic literature and how much is, is kind of journalistic and, and interview led? I would say it's probably a sort of about 80% reading. Um, to try and find good I mean I mean one of the issues I mean I don't want to get too technical but one of the issues in psychology at the moment is the replication crisis mm. so a lot of papers even the standout papers in the um in the area and it's more it's more broad it's broader in social sciences right it's not just in social science yeah exactly yeah. in social science so there's a big replication i mean my next book will partly uh, deal with this um and the replication process has two, at least two components one is 
what's called p-hacking to try and get a significant result where one doesn't really exist. And the other is what's called the problem of external validity. When a particular experiment takes place with a particular group, but when you go to a different country or a different context, it doesn't replicate because this is social science and humans respond differently in different contexts. Um, so it's it, I, so I'd say about 80% of it is making sure you have a robust finding before you go to the journalistic question of how do we how does one convey that finding in a way uh, that is digestible and to carry on asking about process what do your kind of writing days look like do you follow a structure do you see how you feel on the day um, I, I, I'm very random, really, because the dates can be quite varied. I might have something on, uh, I might have a column to write. So when it comes to writing the book, I try and find time as and when, if that makes sense. So if I've got a half a day off, I'll uh, try and get in the right frame of mind and, and read as much as I can and then start writing. So, yeah, it, it depends a lot on, on the structure of the week. Do you think there's ever a risk that, that you know you could become a prisoner of your own success? That you've you've had these like kind of very successful ideas led books, and that you're under pressure, perhaps from your publishers from elsewhere to kind of replicate in that mold. Is that ever frustrating that you feel you might want to do something completely different? For instance. Yeah, well, I think the kids' book was was a real release and and something different. But I love writing these ideas books. Of mine. I absolutely love writing them. The next one is is different because it will be about history. Um, Could you tell and, us a bit about that? Yeah, so this will be about the about the history of our species from the time of the agricultural revolution through to today, and looking at reinterpreting. Uh, lots of different things from the uh, fall of the Roman Empire to the Industrial Revolution. I'll be drawing upon interdisciplinary academic work that I think is going to revolutionise our understanding of our history and our, to a certain extent, our species. Um, so I'm really excited about it and I'm desperately keen to carve out a bit of time to, to, to start writing about it. Would you ever write anything fictional? I would love to. If I, I, I so there, I'd, I think I'd need a lot of practice. I'm a great believer that practice leads to success. I think I'd need a good ten years to practice to write a fiction book. I don't think I have that natural facility, but uh, I would like possibly a children's book at some point. What is the reaction from the children's books being? You mentioned how you know the the letters from readers and how, like many writers, that's tremendously important to you. Have you had reaction from young people as well? Yes, yeah, what well, from from kids, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 all all the time, all the time. I mean, it I mean, it sold really, really well in the UK, um, and it won, you know, Children's Book of the Year at a. Um, what are they called? The Nibbies, the Nibbies event, uh, which was wonderful. Uh, uh, yes, I've been blown away by the response of, of You Are Awesome. I've even got my son reading it at the moment, although he is not such a big fan, frankly. He's uh, six years old. His name's Teddy, and he critiques it violently most evenings. Uh, but at least he's getting through it. But no, I've, I've, it's, um, it's, it's been a really enjoyable thing to do. We're, you know, we're in the middle of the coronavirus lockdown. Uh, at the moment, um, I think you know, we're likely to be here for a little while yet. From your your kind of work on looking at learning institutions and and things like that, what do you think when the big kind of wash up, the public inquiry or whatever is done at the end of this, that are going to be the the key points that that are drawn out or that should be drawn out? It's difficult to be sure at the moment, but uh, my my most recent book, Rebel Ideas, is about the power of diverse thinking. If you get diverse thinkers in a room trying to solve a multifaceted problem, you get a much better result. I suspect, but I'm not sure, that one of the issues is going to be a lack of diversity in decision making, that you really want not just epidemiologists, but you want epidemiologists who have had different experiences, not just flu, but SARS and MERS. Um, you want complexity theorists. You want decision makers who live in tall tower blocks because they would have a particular perspective on how a policy... Because remember, any policy on coronavirus has effects of very broad range and i think that it, we may well come to the conclusion i mean so so the opening story in the book is the cia um 
and its inability to understand to predict the dangers right? to predict 9/11. And I think so. So if you just think about prediction, Mark, if you think about this, the art of prediction, it is clear that the biggest single element in making wise predictions is optimized cognitive diversity. And I'm not clear because they don't tell us who was in the modeling group of the UK, at least, feeding into SAGE. We don't know. And I don't know who's in SAGE either. And we haven't yet seen the modeling that they're using to make the big economic decision that is live at the time we are talking. Um, So I think that may well be what comes out of a future review. So to be clear, you still want experts, just experts with diverse experiences. <laughs> so you you need depth and breadth. So if um, uh, what would be a good example? Um, if you think, I mean, so so a very clear example is if you take the greatest economic forecasters in the world and take the most accurate forecaster that forecast is less accurate than you would get if you took the top six or ten forecasters and took the average of their forecasts. Um, that sounds really odd, but it's to do with cognitive diversity. You get the That's with economic forecasting. Of course, with this, with the coronavirus, any decision has an impact both on the economy and any prediction is drawing on epidemiology, the properties of the virus, the behavioural consequences of policy. And there you need really diverse teams, but you need diversity optimised for the problem. Um, I go into this in a lot of detail in Rebel Ideas, um, and I won't be at all surprised. In fact, I've already had feedback from some of the top academics in uh, some in the world who have come to me and said, do you realise that this is the basic underlying problem here? But as I say, I found it difficult to uh, verify that because I don't know who are making the decisions and you don't know on the basis on which they're being made. You, we don't have enough clarity yet. This is a, this is genuinely the final question because we are against our time limit. But the, the way that in the policy discussion, a lot of people talk about the science as a kind of homogenous thing that we are being guided by and, and things like that. It's, it's very understandable, I suppose, that politicians will say that. But do you think that is a, a valid way to talk or it's a, a simplification? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty confident that Sir Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty were in place as the chief scientific advisor and chief medical officer before Boris Johnson became prime minister. Mm. So he inherited... Uh, I mean, Whitty is an epidemiologist by background, um, but it just may well be that they had a particular lens on this problem. They were thinking about it through the prism of flu when it has very different properties. It's very difficult to test what might have happened had a different group of people been in the room as the decisions were being made. But I wish they'd published the modelling sooner. You see, in a, in a period, time of war, you don't want to publish your decision making because it gives the enemy a chance to anticipate what you're going to do. This virus doesn't have that capacity to anticipate. So the more they can publish, the more they can get eyeballs on the problem and to highlight mistakes or potential i think they'll have the public and the scientific community really behind them on that um but as i say i don't envy for one moment politicians having to make very gravely consequential decisions on the basis of great deal of uncertainty and with scientific opinion itself divided well look matthew thank you for being a great guest on the podcast and thanks for your patience with the slightly frustrating connection and wishing wishing you all the best with your projects going forward Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it very much. Hello, it's us again. Uh, Rachel, what was your uh, take on the Matthew Said interview? Uh, Technical difficulties aside, which I'm sure will have been ironed out by the time the episode is produced, uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed that episode a lot. Uh, Matthew's had a really interesting and varied career and uh, quite a controversial one in places. The Team Sky stuff uh, it was good to cover that. What did you think? Yeah, again, I thought very interesting in kind of that, that genre he's operating in, these kind of ideas-led non-fiction. We talked about the the overlap with Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, I think it was good that we, we put some of the tougher questions to him about, um, you know, how the, the Team Sky stuff looks in the light of light of what's come out um, more recently. Also, interestingly, he has this kind of parallel consultancy business that he's run alongside his journalism and his writing for a long time. I also remember... Um, enjoying the fact that his mother is his best research assistant. I hope she gets uh, a good credit at the front of every book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope she's properly remunerated. Um, 
Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Acom. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer is Nicola Keane. Our social media is by Katie Lee. Our graphic design is by James Edgar. And our score is by Jess Danheiser. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes, on Twitter at Take Notes Always, on Patreon at Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.